All right. Now we good? All right. Um, I don't know about you, but driving in this morning, I was just appreciating the beauty of the summer morning. It was really beautiful this morning. Um, as many of you know, my wife, Hannah, and I have four children, and it is one of my greatest joys in life to be a father to those four children. But if I'm being honest, it's also, honestly, probably the hardest thing that I do. Um, I frequently find myself at a loss for what to do in given situations that arise on a daily basis. Uh, I also find myself many times limited or failing because of my own sin in my parenting. So sometimes I don't know what to do, and sometimes I know what to do and fail to do it. I fail to bring perfect justice and grace together. I fail to bring discipline and love together. But we serve a heavenly father who does not fail at that. He does it perfectly through Christ's work on the cross. One of the things I do love about parenting is many times, somewhere in the midst of disciplining one of my children, they'll come to me wanting a hug. And what are they saying in that moment? They're saying, Dad, I know that something I've done has displeased you, but are we good? Are we right? And we can come to God, and he has open arms because of what Christ has done. If you're a child of God this morning, you can come to him, and he has those open arms, and his response is, we are good. We're right. And so we can come in joy. In a minute, we're going to have a, a, a confession together. And that, that confession is looking at our sin and saying, we have failed, we have dropped the ball, we have sinned against the good God, a holy God. But we can come in joy. Our call to worship this morning, our responsive readings from Psalm 33, we can come in joy because of what Christ has done. So today, let's, let's come in humility, let's come in joy for who God is, what he's done for us. Let's read together from Psalm 33. Read responsibly. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing to him a new song. For the word of the Lord is upright. He loves righteousness and justice. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for being a perfect father, one who perfectly combines justice and grace. Lord, thank you for accomplishing the work through your son on the cross that we can come to you in boldness and that you have open arms. Lord, help us to, to realize the joy that that brings. Help us to, to live in that joy, to live in the, the combination of humility for our own sin and the joy of your loving acceptance of us through the work of Christ. Help us to worship you this morning in light of that. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. And help us to worship you together, Lord. In your name, amen.
You may be seated, sorry. The Lord promises forgiveness to all who come to him in humility and repentance. Let us go together to the throne of grace to seek his mercy. Let's stand and worship together.
Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you, in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart.
also gathered to join together in fellowship, so please take a moment and greet one another. Nice, nice opening. And as you're uh, being seated, I just wanted to extend a special greeting those of you who are uh, visiting with us today, we're really happy that you're here. Uh, my name is Tim Whitmer. I'm the uh, interim pastor for the time being, and uh, it's been a joy for me to be here, and I believe and hope that for you, it will be a joy for you as well. And um, as you see, the ushers have come forward to uh, give you the uh, record books, the visitor registration, registration for everybody, actually, so please take a moment and let us know. Uh, that you're here. Uh, most of you would have gotten this by way of uh, email, but I did send out a little uh, update from your interim pastor. So if you didn't get that, or if you're a visitor, please pick one up. They're uh, available out there uh, in the narthex as you as you leave. And I just like to say that it's an honor to be here, and uh, I think you'll be encouraged by what you read in that note. Now let me lead us together in prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come to you this morning filled with joy and thanksgiving in the mercy and love that you have shown to us in Jesus Christ. We are so amazed that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that you've called us together in this place, at this time, to worship you, to serve you, to honor you. And Father, we thank you that you have been at work among us. We look forward to seeing what you will continue to do through the ministries of this church, through Kingdom Kids, which has had such a, a good series of meetings that closes out this coming week. Thank you for all who have taken part in that. Thank you for all the families we've met. Pray that you would help us to continue to minister to those that we've met through Kingdom Kids. We also thank you, Father, for uh, new ministries like ESL and the Young Adult Ministry. Please uh, bless those who are, are leading those outreaches, and we thank you for all who have come around the leaders to support. And we are grateful uh, for people in this congregation using their gifts uh, so generously. And Father, we also would lift up today our uh, Missionary of the Month, uh, Tim and Barbara Yates. We thank you for their ministry in Taiwan. We pray that you would uh, give them a restful time while they are here, but that you would also enable them to uh, be uh, in increasingly effective in their ministry there in, in teaching and preaching and discipling. 
And Father, for all those who are serving you in every place around the world, we pray that you would bless the ministry of your word as it goes forth today, not only from this place, but also in every place in which the truthful word of God is, is proclaimed. We ask as well today for those in our congregation, those who, whom we may know as well, who are undergoing hardship of various kinds. Lord, we know that the burdens of this, this world can be very, very heavy. And how we thank you that we don't need to bear them alone, but you are our great uh, burden bearer. But you've also told us uh, to bear one another's burdens. And so, Father, please help us to remember those who are suffering and those who are, uh, who are grieving, Lord, knowing that uh, you are the one who provides the ultimate comfort you are the one who is the comprehensive shepherd who can meet every need, needs that we in our human humanity cannot. And so our God, as we have come before you today, we pray once again that you would bless this offering which we're about to receive and you would use it for your glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. We'll now receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
One thing I failed to mention is that, uh, yes, there are refreshments after the service or times of fellowship, but I, I guess I suppose I'm a little reluctant because that might want you to want me to hasten things along a little bit. But um, <clears throat> we'll look forward to that, too. We're in week seven of our summer series entitled uh, Growing Together, in which we're looking at getting along with one another to the study of uh, a selection of the many one another texts found in the New Testament. Remember that uh, one another is obviously two words in, in English, but it's one word in the Greek, ale alone. And we've also seen that the foundation for every one of them is in the very first one, which is the new commandment that Jesus gave us to love one another as he has loved us. And you can see in your bulletin where we've been in, in our study. And uh, it's been a, a real encouragement to me to, uh, to review these essential elements of our fellowship and gospel community together. And uh, so today we're going to be looking at Romans 15, verse 7, but to set the stage, I'd like to read Romans 15, verses 1 to 7. These will be familiar. Anthony read these last week as well. Romans 15, verses 1 to 7. And if you have a, a Bible or a device, I encourage you to, to look at those because we're going to be moving through some of the context as well. This is God's holy word. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these texts that we've been studying. Pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds to hear what you have to say to us today. And may you continue to transform us into the glorious image of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Last week, uh, Anthony did a great job in setting the context for this message. He was reminding us uh, that here in Romans, uh, particularly chapter 14, Paul was readdressing some issues that he had addressed with the Corinthians, that uh, in the church of Corinth, there were those who were very, uh, very sensitive to eating meat offered to idols, and those would have been referred to as the weaker brothers. Then there were those who, uh, it was no problem for them, they saw that as it was, it was just meat, there was nothing, nothing spiritually influential about eating those particular meats. And so as we come to Romans 14, the same theme existed, and it's probably the background, although here in Romans chapter 14, it's a little more general in terms of concern for people who would not eat meat uh, and only eat vegetables, uh, as opposed to people who would, uh, who would eat meat and vegetables. And also, you can see back in verse 5, there was a concern for days. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another estimates all days alike. And with background, that is probably something like uh, the fact that in the uh, Christian era, the Sabbath has been changed from the seventh day to the first day, and that perhaps there is some confusion as to which day one should hold uh, holy, if you will. And there were other concerns also for the Gentile uh, converts. Uh, last week we saw that Paul rises above all this and points us to Christ, the one around whom we must rally, and who, due to his atonement for our sins and our union with him, is the basis of our union with one another and our unity with one another. And today our focus is on verse 7, which is, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And as we look at this text, we're going to be seeing the... Uh, the mandate, the model, 
and the mission. The mandate, the model, and the mission. First of all, the mandate. The uh, English Standard Version says, welcome one another. But you'll notice in the bulletin, uh, the text says, the bulletin says, accept one another. And this is one of those areas where you can take uh, a Greek word and there are various ways you can translate it. Uh, it's kind of like uh, just in life. Uh, I've been interested to notice how many different ways that people can describe speed bumps. Have you noticed that? So you're driving, actually, I was driving through New Holland and a little while ago, it said speed awareness riser. <laughs> but more recently, actually just this week, I, I was going down a road and there was a sign that said speed cushion. <laughs> and let me tell you what, friends, there's nothing like a cushion about it. But translators uh, who are wholly committed to scripture can translate a Greek word in different ways. Uh, you'll notice that, uh, as I mentioned, the text says, welcome. The title I've used is accept one another. And what does it, what's the bottom line here? Well, the bottom line is the idea is giving a wholehearted welcome to one another, accepting one another, one another as Christ has accepted you accepting one another as Christ has accepted you. Now the challenge is that we're all different. And believe me folks, you're different. <laughs> and I'm different. And we want everybody though to think the way we think, to be like us, but it's not gonna happen. Some of you may know that many years ago, uh, Barb and I worked at Victor Weaver's, now Tyson Foods, and uh, it was quite an experience for a summer job, but uh, a few years ago, the New Holland Ministry was invited to, uh, to a meeting back there at, at Tyson Foods. And uh, so we went back, and one of the things they offered as a, as a part of the meeting was a, a, a plant tour. And so we, we, they served us lunch, and yes, of course, chicken was on the menu. But after we went on our tour, and it was, it was neat to see some of the places that we'd worked in there. And, but there was a new, at that time, a relatively new product they were making. They were making chicken fries for Burger King. And they just chopped up the, the chicken and they formed it into perfect fry-like shapes. And they, would, they came flying out of this machine. I can't tell you how many that would come out per minute. But there were ladies on either side of that conveyor belt making sure that they were exactly alike. Their eyes were fast and their hands were faster, if that's possible. You could see them, you know, pushing things away. They had to conform perfectly and completely or they were going to be rejected. And many times that's the way things are in the church, but that's not who we are. Uh, there was a, a movement in the middle of the last century called the uh, Church Growth Movement. And uh, they, Donald McGavern specifically, advocated what's called a homogeneous unit principle. And as they were talking about church growth and church planting, they were saying, well, you know, there are certain things that people should have in common if the church is going to grow. They need to be alike ethnically, linguistically, socially, educationally, vocationally, and economic identities. If they do, if they are, churches will be healthier. You know what I say to that? Boring. <laughs> you know what else I say to that? Unbiblical. Because we've been called from a diversity of places, backgrounds, and sadly, we still tend to draw lines that differentiate people. What are some of the lines that we divide? Race, what people look like, nationality, where you're from, socioeconomically, how much money you have or how much money you make, where you live, the other side of the tracks, what you do, are you white collar, blue collar, political convictions, we've got all kinds of gaps. We've got gender gaps, generation gaps, income gaps. You even see it in the schools. They're eggheads, phys eds, in crowds, geeks, 
I won't tell you which crowd I was in. <laughs> Beauty is in the not so beautiful. Well, that's an easy one for you to figure out. <laughs> but sometimes there are lines that divide in the church. It can be more subtle. The kind of music you prefer, the kind of service you like, uh, the way that you choose to educate your children. These can all ironically be ways that the devil uses to divide us. So speaking of terminology, what do you call it when we make assumptions about people based on the way they look, where they're from, or how much money they make? What's that assumption called? It's called prejudice. It's called prejudice. Literally prejudging people on the basis of such categories. It's drawing lines that keep people out based on those different uh, subject matters or categories. There are so many of them that we could easily become so divided, we could become so many lines, so many divisions. But we all have them. We have to admit that we have them. Hopefully they're not as bad as they used to be, but we have them. And where do they come from? We learn some of them from our upbringing. We learn some through experience. We learn some through surrounding, through the surrounding culture. Prejudice is a, is a condition of the heart that often then develops something in our mind which is called a stereotype. Now, a stereotype, believe it or not, has an actual technical process. Stereotyping is a process of making metal plates by taking a mold of composed type in another material and then taking from this mold a cast in a type of metal. Sub-definition simplified and standardized conception or image. Stereotyping is having a, a conception, having a prejudice, and then presuming that everyone who looks like that or talks like that is literally made from the same mold. And that's inaccurate. Uh, may I share a stereotype that particularly touches me? Lots of people have a stereotype about what a minister is. That's one of the reasons that when I'm in a conversation with new people, I don't immediately tell them what my vocation is. You know why? Because they're likely to clam up. Oh, you're a minister. Oh. And sometimes when I'm on the golf course, uh, I go out by myself sometimes, or my friend and I were just out uh, a few weeks ago, and they paired us up with, with someone else. And once again, on the golf course, uh, I'm not going to immediately tell them that I'm a pastor because they'll clam up. And when they do find out that I'm a minister, they clam up. <laughs> and then their previous expression of distaste and their bad shot <laughs> would suddenly change. <laughs> or if they express it, they say, oh, I'm sorry, you're a pastor. Come on. We're regular people with a calling, but I understand that's not as, as dangerous a stereotype, for sure, as many. But there's even a more sinister evidence of prejudice in the heart. It's called discrimination. This is when the prejudice in our hearts and the stereotypes in our minds make its way into the way we treat other people or the way we talk about them. Paul's making the point that this is not appropriate for Christians, and certainly not between Christians, because Jesus has given us a model. The mandate, accept one another, the model as Christ has accepted or welcomed you. How did Jesus accept you? Did you have to pass an income test? When it comes to the good news of the gospel, it doesn't matter how much you make. Is there an in income threshold you must reach? Is there a credit rating you have to have? Did you have to pass an IQ test? When it comes to the gospel, does it matter how smart you are? Is there an entrance exam? Is there an SAT? Spiritual aptitude test? It's only through the Spirit that we understood our need for the gospel. Do you have the right identification? Do you have a passport? 
Did you have to present your right ID? Doesn't matter what color your skin, what language you speak, you know this gospel is for all people from any nation, tribe, tongue, who will repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Did you have to pass a righteousness test? Does it matter how good you are? You know, sometimes when I invite people to come to church, they say, well, <clears throat> I'm not ready yet. I gotta get my act together. <laughs> no, you don't. There's nobody in this room that has their act together. We're a bunch of sinners saved by grace who are trying to make progress along the road of sanctification. The scriptures make it clear that the gospel isn't just for somebodies, it's for anybody and especially for nobodies. It's for anybody who sees their need for forgiveness, repents, and believes in Jesus. That's the model. But you'll notice something very interesting here in our text. Verse 8 says, For, I tell you. And if you look, if you look, particularly the, the Greek text that I have, and many of the translations that you have, verse 7 actually begins another section. Actually begins another section where Paul now gives us the application in verses 8 and following. And what was the big elephant in the room in Paul's day? Well, the elephant in the room in Paul's day was the reception of the Gentiles. It was the reception of the Gentiles. Anthony made reference to this last week. And Paul says, look, accept one another as Christ has accepted you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant of the circumcised to show God's truthfulness. So those are the Jewish believers Jews who have come to faith in Christ to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. But it's not just for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles. And why this is of concern, and Paul is encouraging the Romans because in the Roman church, the Roman church was largely made up of Gentiles, non-Jewish believers. And there were those that were, they were called Judaizers who made non people with non-Jewish backgrounds feel like second-class citizens. But you notice Paul then, he says, okay, let me, let me show you, in case it's not clear to you, that this is what God has had in mind from the very beginning. He gives a series of proof texts, if you will. Verse 9, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. That's from 2 Samuel. Next one's from Deuteronomy, rejoice the Gentiles with his people. The next one's from the Psalms, praise the Lord, O you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And then there's one from Isaiah, the root of Jesse will come, even he who rises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. And what Paul has done here, he has covered every division of the Old Testament the law, the prophets, and the writings to make his point that you are welcome, Romans. You are welcome. And there should be no discrimination based on ethnicity. The key issue is the gospel. That was such a big problem, they had to have meetings about it. We as Presbyterians love meetings. This is why I know the apostles were Presbyterians, because they had meetings. <laughs> You know, after, after uh, the, the remarkable conversion among the, the, the Gentiles in Peter's ministry, they had a meeting in Acts chapter 11. And then again in Acts chapter 15, when Paul and Barnabas brought back stories of, of, of non-Jews by the droves coming to Christ, they had another meeting. And they, had, and they said, James, of course, the half-brother of our Lord, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem, said, okay, which is a couple of things we want them to keep in mind, but may God be praised because they are welcomed into the kingdom even as we have been. But old prejudices, prejudices die hard, but may we never forget that the basis of our access to God, each of us is through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the only way. 
When I was a little boy growing up in New Holland, uh, one of the biggest deals for us, one of the best exciting times of the year was the farm show. I'm sure many of you feel about that, that way here in, in Ephrata. Of course, we always thought our farm show was better in New Holland. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we, we were so happy because Kitty's Day was on Friday of Farm Show Week. And uh, we always, we had Fridays off. Imagine that. They let us out because uh, the teachers knew we wouldn't be any good for anything anyway uh, in school. So we were, they, they turned us loose. Now my dad was on the Farm Show Committee in New Holland for, for decades. And among the, uh, the jobs he had was assigning uh, the placement of the various concessions. But I remember one Kitty's Day that, that he took me by the hand and he took me to this huge trailer. And on the outside it said, Morris P. Hannum Enterprises. This was the guy who was in charge of the whole thing. And he took me up the steps, we went inside, and there was this huge desk with this man sitting beside it smoking a big cigar. And he said, Hello, Bob. Who is this? He said, this is my son, Timmy. Don't try it, folks. <laughs> Don't try it. Don't try it. It's my son, Timmy. He said, oh, hello, Timmy. How are you? Are you having a good time at the fair? And I said, yes, sir. And he opened the top drawer, and he pulled out a pile of ride tickets that thick. Now there were strips of ride tickets. There were 10 ride tickets on each strip and there was a strip that thick. So I'd go and have a good time. Now the problem was the ride tickets were only good on Kitty's Day, uh, but I was the most popular kid on the Midway. <laughs> I couldn't possibly use up the 300 or 400 tickets. But you know what? There was no way I could have gone barging into Morris P. Hannum's presence if it wasn't for my dad. And there's no way that you or I can ever barge into the presence of God except through Jesus Christ. That's what unites us. It is his work on our behalf that the night unites us because it was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. So we have to be sure that as individuals and as a church, we are recognizing uh, the glory of the diversity of the body of Christ. It's one of the things I love about the church. It's, yes, it's fair to say you're different. I'm not gonna be offended if you say, hey, you know, Pastor Tim, you're different. Because I am, we're all different. But what's the mission? The mission is for the glory of God. There are very few things that speak more powerfully of the gospel and the glory of God to our world as much as the diversity in the body of Christ. And we have that diversity here in Ephrata. We have a diversity of, of socioeconomic backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, educational backgrounds, vocational backgrounds, and we're all one. This is what the gospel has done for us. Because I can look at you and you can look at me and say, you know, I know you're here not because of your own merit, because of what Jesus did. He's the one who brought us together. He's the one we all serve and worship. A couple of application points. Accepting others as Christ accepted me means tearing down the walls I have built in my heart that keep others out. That's exactly the language that Paul uses when he's speaking to the Ephesian church, if you remember. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 13, he makes this point. Listen to how similar this language is. He says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. 
So he not only killed the hostility that existed between us and God, but he killed the hostility that existed between Jews and non-Jews. He kills the hostility that exists when we would draw lines on the basis of other things. There was a statement that came out about the homogeneous unit principle, by the way, that I think helps here. He said, this did not mean that Jews ceased to be Jews or Gentiles ceased to be Gentiles. It did mean, however, that their racial differences were no barrier to their fellowship. For through their union with Jesus Christ, both groups were now joint heirs, joint members of the same body, and joint partakers of the promise. The union of Jews and Gentiles in Christ was the mystery which was revealed to Paul and which he proclaimed to all. Thus, the church as a single new humanity or God's new society is central to the gospel. Our responsibility is both to preach, to teach it, to exhibit it before the watching world. We have to remember that when we have different viewpoints on things within the church, don't we? As long as they're not gospel issues, we need sometimes to agree to disagree. We need to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. We need to be graciously seeking to persuade one another if we have a conviction. We have to make sure that we're working on principle and not preference. But all of it is in submission to the Word of God. As you and I know, we're all growing. None of us has a perfect understanding of Scripture. And so we must be sure sometimes to hold uh, some things on our hands lightly, certainly not with a fist. Second, accepting others as Christ accepted me means rejoicing in the diversity with which the Lord is building his church, but which in its very existence brings him glory. The church is not a plate of chicken fries. It's a shady maple smorgasbord. <laughs> That's what we are. That's what I see. And you have often heard, heard me talk about the church in Upper Darby, which was ethnically, ethnically diverse, truly glorified God in its ethnic uh, diversity. As I mentioned earlier, every single church has its own kind of diversity, which speaks to, uh, to the glory of God and the power of the gospel. There's no other explanation for it. And so I think what I'm trying to say is, as Paul tells us to accept one another, as Christ has accepted you to the glory of God. Don't draw lines where God doesn't draw lines. Because in the economy of redemption, there's only one line. And the line is the division between those who have come to Jesus and those who have not. But in terms of those who have come to Jesus Christ, we have an obligation to, to love one another, to serve one another, to, to be a blessing to one another. And yet those who have not yet come to Christ, what's our obligation to them? It's to love them and to serve them and to winsomely reach out to them and bring them into the fellowship of faith in Jesus Christ. Not setting boundaries that say keep out, making sure that the fellowship of the church is open to all who believe and receive in Jesus Christ. And so the gospel requires us to take a hard look at our prejudices. And maybe if you don't think you have one, maybe you should ask your spouse. Because sometimes it comes out when you might not want it to. Gospel requires us to consider the stereotypes we might have. But fundamentally, the gospel requires that we accept one another as Christ has accepted us to the glory of God. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we come before you this morning, we confess to you that uh, we are sinners saved by grace. Thank you for walking us into, into your kingdom. Thank you for walking, welcoming us into your family while we were yet sinners. Thank you for that joyful welcome the Father gave to the prodigal son. 
Lord, help us not to be like the elder brother who resented the rich welcome, the return. Father, I ask today if there's someone here who has not yet come to faith in Christ, they would do so, that they would see that this fellowship, this blessing, these uh, mercies are available to all who will believe, repent and believe, turning from sin to the Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that we as a fellowship here at RPC would remember that each of us is a work in process, work in progress. We're thankful that God has, has told us that he's going to finish it one day. In the meantime, Lord, help us to be patient with one another. Help us to be sure to be, to be measuring uh, our convictions by, by Scripture and growing in love for one another. We thank you in Jesus' name. chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may be, about, may you be excuse me, you may abound in hope. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, we have several announcements this morning. Um, just before we go to that, uh, I was just made aware that uh, Roger Kimber is going to be going to Ghana this week, I believe. Is that correct, Roger? Um, let's just take a moment to, to pray for him in that trip. Lord, we, we pray for Roger and any that may be uh, going with him. We pray you would bless this trip, um, that you would use it for your honor and your glory, that you would give them safety. Um, we pray that it would be a good experience for, for him and all those with him that you would use it to grow them and, again, that you would use it to glorify yourself. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, and we pray for your blessing on it. In your name, amen. Um, well, as far as announcements go, uh, we'll start with Emily Rudy. She has one to share. Good morning, 
everybody. I have just a couple of hospitality points to bring to your attention this morning. Um, in a little less than two weeks, uh, we have our RPC, or no, a little less than three weeks, we have our RPC picnic on August 12th. Uh, chicken barbecue is going to be provided, so we just ask that you bring a dessert or a side dish to share. Everybody's welcome, and we hope to see everybody there. Um, also, on the back cover, you'll notice a note on there for a cakewalk. It's a good old-fashioned cakewalk, and if you'd like to participate, you can bring a pie or brownies or a cake or some dessert. And um, if you've never done one before, it kind of works like musical chairs, but with cake. And who doesn't love that? So uh, we encourage you to bring along a cake or dessert to share for that. I also want to bring to your attention, um, on the inside of your bulletin, there's a note there about a hospitality survey. Um, this, the, the purpose of this survey is to help us plan for future fellowship and hospitality opportunities for all of us here at RPC. Um, as a ministry, we really want to be focused on all age groups, and this will help us to plan for that in the future. It's very brief. It should take just a few minutes. There is a link um, in the bulletin, but there will also be a link emailed possibly this Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, so keep your eye out for that. There's also paper copies right next to the interim pastor update out in the narthex. So if you'd prefer to do that um, on paper, you can do that and hand it to anybody on the hospitality committee. Thanks very much. Thank you, Emily, and the hospitality committee. They do a lot around here. So if you think of it, sometimes say, uh, express your thanks. Um, a couple other announcements. Next Sunday, there will be a reflection meeting for anyone who has helped with Kingdom Kids. Um, we're nearing the end of our, our Kingdom Kids. Uh, there's going to be a meeting next Sunday at 11 a.m. after the service to for anybody who helped with that. Uh, so keep that on your radar. Uh, also, there are several lost and found items on a cart back by the kitchen. Um, check that out. Make sure you didn't leave something there. Any unclaimed items will be donated. Um, there are some nice coffee cups, water bottles, and jackets. So uh, you might, <laughs> might want to check that out to make sure you didn't misplace something. Uh, also, August 6th, we are having a mission luncheon uh, for Matt and Jen Irvin and Stephen and Charity, jo Charity Jones. Uh, the luncheon will be provided, but mark your calendars uh, for that as well. Uh, as always, we encourage you to read your bulletins. Uh, for more information uh, and for more details. Uh, Rusty Rudder also has an announcement from the session, uh, so he'll come and share that. Good morning. I'd just like to provide a little more details and update with Flourish. I know there's an announcement in the bulletin, but I just want to go through a, a few more things. Session did meet this past Tuesday with Flourish. We spent two hours going over the results of the surveys and interviews that were completed. Uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, they came up with five pain points that we need to be working through as a session and a congregation as well. Uh, the session has decided that we broke into four small groups to go through this to start looking at uh, the information provided, coming up with some opportunity solutions to uh, provide uh, growth for our church and ourselves. Uh, we're going to go into committee after this is completed. I'll be heading that up. Fred Thomas, Nick Crowther, Joe and Ronnie, uh, Dr. Whitmer will also be on this committee, and we're going to look to a uh, congregation to put a couple individuals on as well. We want you know to have transparency. We want to have trust built into this. I appreciate Dr. Whitmer's words uh, this morning, just to give you a little glimpse of some of those pain points. One is that we don't do uh, differences well. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Whitmer, for sharing you know, and accepting one another. So we have some opportunities before us. It'll be a little while yet till we do come before the congregation with results and opportunities to move forward. But just want to let everybody know that we're working towards this. We are already in that process and we'll continue to uh, keep you apprised of our progress. Thank you. You can go and have some uh, refreshments and fellowship. You are dismissed.